Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Patrick, who will be discussing newborns exposed to substances, understanding their needs, and supporting their caregivers. Dr. Patrick is the director of the Vanderbilt Center for Child Health Policy and an assistant professor of pediatrics and health policy at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He's also an attending neonatologist at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Patrick. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about the birth of a newborn? You know, for me, the first thing I think about is the birth of my two daughters. Perhaps the best days of my life. Those feelings of joy that were transformative. But as pediatricians, we know that the birth experience can be complex for some, and for some, it's fear and it's shame. I first met Tammy uh, about two years ago. I took care of her son at about 48 hours of life. He had profound weight loss, jaundice, and he was admitted to our neonatal ICU. When I saw him, he was also having other clinical signs too. He had increased muscle tone and tremors. He's inconsolable. And we talked to Tammy about whether or not she was using any substances during pregnancy, and, and she denied it. But about two days later, an umbilical cord drug test came back positive for buprenorphine, a medicine that's commonly used to treat addiction. And I'll never forget walking into her room. And I sat down next to her and I told her about the drug test. The first thing she said to me was, are they gonna take away my baby? And I sat with her as tears filled her eyes. And the gravity of the situation and the complexity of the situation, it took a hold of me as well. We're gonna talk a little bit today about the complexity that our families face. Later on today, we can talk, we're gonna have a session focused on some specific protocols, but today we're gonna to step back and talk about the opioid crisis and where we are today. So our roadmap, first we're gonna talk about the opioid crisis today. Then we're gonna talk about treatment, why it's hard to get and important. We're gonna talk about neonatal abstinence syndrome, some care patterns, and then talk about discharge and some policy change. We certainly hear a lot about the opioid crisis today, and that's not without accident. Its impacts in communities across the United States is tangible. In 2016, 20,000 more people died from an overdose than died from car accidents. This year, more people will die from an overdose than at the height of the HIV epidemic. And if we look from 1999 to now, more than 600,000 people have died from an overdose, an extraordinary amount. But of course, this hasn't been limited to just adults. The effect is palpable also on pregnant women and infants. In 2016, there were more than 30,000 infants diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal. That's about one infant born on average in the United States every 15 minutes. And it's increased substantially in recent years. Between 2000 and 2016, a near eight-fold increase. Now, neonatal abstinence syndrome, just paying for the birth hospitalization, accounts for $1 billion, excuse me, half of $1 billion uh, each year. You know, I like details. I like to get in the weeds. This is why I'm a neonatologist. If you give me a blood gas, I'm a happy person. But as we step back and we understand the context of where our families are, sometimes we need to step deeper, and we need to step deeper uh, to look at the forest and understand uh, what, what the broader context is. When we do that, we begin to understand that 75% of pregnant women that are in treatment for opioid use disorder have a history of sexual trauma. We understand that when we compare people who have adults who have five ACEs compared to those who have zero, they are eight times more likely to have substance use disorder and 10 times more likely to inject drugs. More recently, economists have been looking at communities and what's going on in communities that may be leading to the opioid crisis. They've found that maybe there is something about the community, the change of the social structure, the lack of economic opportunity that may be leading to some of what we're seeing. Last week, I was in my hometown in West Virginia, and these are a few pictures that I took. West Virginia has been disproportionately affected by the opioid crisis, consistently having the highest rates of overdose death in the United States. In my county, uh, where I was born uh, last year, 3.5% of the infants born there were diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome. You know, we wonder, combining the, the work of the economists that, that have been had done recently in the adult world, whether or not this phenomenon was playing out 
in communities across the United States in relation to maternal child health outcomes as well. So our group, we looked at 580 counties across the United States to try to understand what was happening in those communities and those counties that may be leading to higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. I'm gonna focus in on one of the states we looked at, and that's Kentucky. In the orange here, you'll see the darker the color, the higher the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. In the gray is long-term unemployment. We looked at a 10-year moving average at the county level. If you look just visually, you can see how these over overlay. Counties that have higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome tend to have higher rates of long-term unemployment. If you're from the region, you also recognize, too, that these are predominantly remote rural communities and predominantly in Appalachian counties. Overall, in the study period, we found that long-term unemployment increased from 65 to 8.2%. And of course, we studied during a period of the Great Recession as well. But here's what's striking. Particularly in remote rural communities, we found that long-term unemployment was associated with higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And in remote, remote rural communities, a two percentage point increase in long-term unemployment was associated with a 34% higher rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. We also wanted to know what was going on in communities in terms of access. So we looked at mental health shortage areas. What was stunning was just some of the descriptive statistics. When we looked at urban communities, 80%, based upon HRSA's definitions, were mental health partial or complete shortage areas, going up to 90% in remote rural communities. In this study, we also found that counties that had shortages of mental health providers also had higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. The thought being that we have untreated mental health uh, disorders that go on for a long period of time, subsequently lead to opioid use disorder, and then infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. So why does this matter? This can feel daunting. It's part of the broader context. Oftentimes, we talk about the opioid and the drug withdrawal. And look, there's no question that relationships exist. In my home state of West Virginia, again, uh, in a town called Kermit, West Virginia, McKesson at one point was putting 10,000 pills of opioids a day into a, into a town that had a population of 400. That is certainly part of, the, part of the problem, but this is also part of the problem as well. I wanna talk about treatment, why it's important and why it's hard to get as well. We know that medications for opioid use disorder improve lives, improve outcomes. For pregnant women with opioid use disorder, the research is pretty clear. It reduces risk of relapse and overdose death, as well as HIV and hepatitis C. And for infants, they're more likely to go to term and have higher birth weights, though it does come with some risk of drug withdrawal. Despite the overwhelming evidence that these medications work, only about half of pregnant women with opioid use disorder who get into treatment today get medications for opioid use disorder. Again, in our team, we wanted to understand what were some of the barriers. And look, we know that the barriers getting into treatment may be complex, and some are personal. And maybe you don't think you need to get into treatment. But we wanted to look at what were some of the institutional barriers. So we did a, a field experiment, a randomized secret shopper study, where we had pregnant women and women of reproductive age trying to get into treatment. We used the publicly available SAMHSA treatment locator to do this. So this is the list where people say, go if you need to get treatment. We called 10,000 times in 10 states. About 70% of the time, we couldn't get anybody on the other end of the phone. The reasons for that were, number one, we tried more than five times and couldn't reach anybody. And number two, they were a medical office that no longer provided addiction treatment. But for the times that we did get someone on the, on the phone, we found that pregnant women were less likely to be accepted in communities by a substantial margin. So what do we think is happening? We think that in part, we have obstetricians who are not comfortable taking care of addiction and addiction medicine docs that are not comfortable taking care of pregnant women. And pregnant women are, are lost in the middle. So as we talk about moving ahead, how can we do this differently in our hospital systems? How can we engage families in this complex uh, mashup of trauma? I wanna talk about how models of care have shifted across the United States and including in our institution as well. The traditional model of care for caring for neonatal abstinence syndrome is by far the most common across the United States is to separate mom and baby. The infant has signs of drug withdrawal, they go off to a neonatal ICU, and we treat them separately. More recently, what we've seen are newer care models where we keep mom and babies together and we try to support the dyad holistically. This is what we've done at, at Vanderbilt as well, learning from many of our colleagues around the country. So we built a team that we call Team Hope. It includes obstetricians, uh, newborn medicine docs, neonatologists, hospitalists, 
but it also includes a multidisciplinary team, social work, child life, and lactation. In the last two years alone, we've had nearly 270 opioid-exposed infants greater than 35 weeks who didn't have another reason to go to the neonatal ICU that we've cared for in this program. And here's what we've seen. We've only treated about 20% of our infants with morphine. This is far lower than we were before. Just keeping mom and baby together seems to be working. That 85% were seen by a child life specialist, and this is because we were able to get funding from a community foundation to help pay for a child life specialist. Most of our moms who are eligible to breastfeed are breastfeeding. They're still breastfeeding at the time of discharge. And here's one of the fundamental shifts that we see. Most of our infants are being discharged from the newborn nursery and now a minority from the neonatal ICU. And these are numbers, but I'll talk a little bit about how this has transformed us, the way we approach things, and the way families perceive things too. But even in the midst of this, one of the things that I think has made one of the biggest differences too in terms of including families has been just being consistent. We know that standardizing care works. So when we started, you may have a mom who's seen in our obstetric clinic who was told you can't breastfeed. Then you are seen in the newborn nursery, yes you can. Then you go to the NICU, oh no you can't. And then back to the hospital medicine where you get a completely different story. So just beginning to do the same thing every time is not only less confusing for families, but improves outcomes. The Ohio Perinatal Collaborative uh, did a multi-center cohort looking at hospitals that strictly adhered to a treatment protocol versus those who didn't. And they found that hospitals, if you just did the same thing every time, you had about half the length of stay. Similarly, the Vermont Oxford Network had a collaborative of 200 hospitals in North America that found as hospitals standardized what they did, they saw reduced length of treatment and reduced length of stay. As we've begun to increase what we've done in the hospital and our lengths of stay have shortened, now five days overall for all opioid exposed infants, one of the things that's become apparent is we need to focus on improving our transitions home. One of the things I worry about a lot in this space is just collectively there is so much focus on reducing length of stay without thinking through what's gonna happen to our families as they go home. So what could a good discharge look like? Well, first it begins with what happens in the hospital. How do we promote that bond early in terms of engaging breastfeeding, engaging the family in the care, including in helping out with scoring, uh, assessing the family's needs, understanding additional risks like hepatitis C, and considers the post-discharge needs. How can we better connect to, uh, to outside hospital services, including home visitation, positive partnerships with child welfare, early intervention, more frequent pediatrician follow-up, and coordination with maternal treatment? So we're a pretty engaged group. Uh, we, we, you know, we've been focusing on this for a couple of years we looked to see how well we were doing. How well were we actually making the referral to earlier intervention? Scheduling an appointment for a pediatrician, scheduling a follow-up for hepatitis C if we needed to, and a couple of other factors. We were doing it 2% of the time, every time, a pretty low amount. So we just paid attention to what we were doing differently. We created a checklist, uh, and then we increased pretty quickly to 60%. But I think part of the issue that we're finding is that this connection to what happens after discharge is just increasingly important. Last thing I want to talk about policy change. There's been a substantial amount of policy change in this space over the last couple of years, and in part that's been focused on the child welfare system. A few years back, there was a series of reports by Reuters that followed infants that were diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome and went home and died. And there was a series of congressional hearings that happened after that. In late 2016, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act created a provision called Plans of Safe Care. And Plans of Safe Care sought to first create a plan that's safe for the infant to go home, but also to engage the family and focus on how we can create moms and caregivers to treatment. Over this last year, we've seen substantially more attention to this space. The Families First Act that allows states to use child welfare dollars for prevention. We've also saw the Support Act that passed that provided greater specificity to what a plan of safe care should be, as well as money. More recently, Representative Schreier also passed in the House a stronger CAPTA bill that goes even further to try to parade, provide greater specificity to what's happening in a space. What's challenging in this space, however, for all of us is we know how this works on the ground, and it's complex. And there's evidence to suggest that communities are really struggling with how to implement this. How do you implement a plan of safe care that makes sure the infant's safe but also connects the mom to treatment? That is much easier said than done. States are confused with this too. So what I believe is that we have a substantial role as pediatricians. A lot of this legislation that's been passed has been because of the AAP support and the, particularly the Washington office. 
And it's our job locally to engage in what's happening in our communities, the plans of safe care, and Families First is being implemented. And it's our job to engage with our states as they're writing these policies, because they are looking for our expertise. We have unique expertise and have an ability to plug in to make a difference for our families. So what can we do as we look at the opioid crisis, and it can feel daunting? The first is just to be aware. I mean, when I first started in this space, uh, I had no idea. Like, the, the term trauma-informed care was not anything I had ever heard of as an ICU doc, right? Give me an, a, a, a tube to intubate someone. This was something that was new to me. And so I think just understanding the context of where our families are, it informs the way we interact with people. The next is to be engaged. And this doesn't have to be something big. You know, so much of what we've heard the last two days has everything to do with just connection with people. So much of what I feel like is at the root of this crisis is a lack of connection with people. So as we sit down and we engage with our families, hear their stories, I think that's a good positive step. And maybe the next positive step is just to standardize how you do breastfeeding at your hospital. Small steps really do make a difference. A few weeks ago, I got an email from a community partner talking about a mom who had delivered at our hospital. And she approached the delivery with fear. She was worried her infant was gonna be removed, that she wasn't gonna be supported. She was worried about the stigma that she would face. But instead, what she found was, a, was an environment that allowed her to, to breastfeed, that supported her, and empowered her. I think we really can make a difference with small changes. Recently, I heard someone say that the antidote to the opioid crisis isn't naloxone, it's community. And I think that's true, but I would go one step further. I think the antidote to the opioid crisis is community and connection. Thank you all for your attention.